Thanks everyone for coming to this week's CHEP seminar. Uh, David Bradford is visiting us here this week from the University of Georgia, where is the Busby Chair of Public Policy. Uh, David's written widely on the economics of reproductive health and pharmaceuticals and substance abuse. Uh, published in the top journals both in health policy and in economics, Review of Economics and Statistics, American Economic Review, Journal of Health Economics, Health Economics, Health Affairs, and today uh, we're lucky to have him here to talk about the impact of prescription drug monitoring programs on uh, marketing of opioids, opioid detailing. Thanks so much for being here. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. I'm done, done for the day. <laughs> Uh, and I'm, uh, I appreciate the opportunity to come to sunny San Diego and <laughs> spend some time with you guys. And I'm impressed with, uh, with your strategy here. I actually uh, uh, grew up in rural Mississippi, which uh, means the same thing as saying I was raised in a Southern Baptist household. And I'm retired from that. But nonetheless, uh, in order to get people to come to meetings, they always fed people. And so I see that, uh, that you've pursued that, uh, that strategy. It works, works really well. Um, so uh, I'm here today to present, uh, contrary to the earlier, I apologize for the bait and switch, uh, the work I was going to present on uh, visit evictions, uh, co-authored with uh, my daughter Ashley. We're not quite there yet, and I, I didn't want to come in front of an economics audience and not have all my... Uh, at least not have more of my, uh, my eyes dotted and T's crossed. So uh, we're presenting some work today that's uh, co-authored with uh, Tween Lynn, uh, who is a PhD student at uh, Indiana, and Coastley Simon, who is a faculty member at uh, SPI Indiana, who uh, Joe knows, I'm sure, perhaps worked with. She and I have just started doing uh, several projects together, which uh, with Coastally mostly means I just sort of hang on for dear life. Uh, and hope to hope to keep up. So, uh, so today we're going to talk about. I want to talk to you about um, uh, pharmaceutical marketing and how those decisions are affected by state policies that are aimed at a different issue, which are prescription drugs, primarily control uh, well, control substances, primarily narcotics and opiates. But we're going to kind of get there uh, through a back door now. I'm uh, an economist who has lived in an economics department, a medical school, and now a school of public policy. So I'm used to people not, uh, not necessarily uh, knowing all the detail, institutional details of the stuff that I'm talking about. So I probably don't have to tell you as economists, but if you have questions at any point in time, uh, raise your hands and let's, let's talk about them, discuss them. This is very, very much a work in progress. Um, so I have my pen. And my paper, and I'm looking forward to all of the, uh, I'll be pointing out all of the flaws that that, uh, that we can work <laughs> on over the next little, little while. It's funny, but I, I, I'm an economist by training, and you, of course, uh, you guys have been very polite. You haven't interrupted me yet. Mostly, this is unusual, right? So when I first moved to uh, the medical school <coughs> setting. Uh, and we and I had a center. Actually, ironically, I was just telling some of your named Cheps. Uh, uh, we brought in economists, and we were several economists there. We were economists, so we treated them like economists. We started asking questions, and we offended all of our medical colleagues because they just could not believe we were so rude as to interrupt the speaker when they were talking. So I've learned that you know people have different cultures. So I prefer a free-flowing conversation. Um, if you don't, just sit there quietly and, and it'll be over quicker. <laughs> anyway. All right. So let's talk, about, uh, let's talk about what the topic of conversation uh, is going to be about today. Um, there, um, it's a surprising uh, lack of discussion in the literature about the choice architecture that physicians uh, face when they're going through, uh, when they're making their prescribing decisions. We've got a literature on advertising, most of it focused on direct-to-consumer advertising rather than direct-to-physician advertising, uh, primarily because uh, information about detailing, that is the, and I, uh, so I'm going to start using jargon, uh, which of course we all love to do. Uh, so detailing, the word you're going to hear me use uh, uh, repeatedly today, is the uh, interaction that, uh, that pharmaceutical representatives, people who are marketing for a pharmaceutical company, have with a physician, or they'll go visit a physician. In the old days, what that meant is they would get 
uh, an appointment with the doctor. They would sit down with the doctor and pr bring literature, uh, talk about the advantages of particular drugs, and also oftentimes bring free samples that the doctor would then put in the sample closet and distribute to his or her patients. You know, I don't know if you had the experience recently. Actually, I have not had the experience, have not had the experience in maybe a decade now. But it used to be when you went to the doctor and, you, and the doctor prescribed you something, they would give you like two weeks free medicine. Uh, anybody have that happen? Actually, I'm curious. Anybody have that happen recently? That's happened with you? Anybody else? My wife. Your wife? Has? Yeah. So a lot of doctors now don't take the free samples anymore. In part because what it requires is that they sit down and talk to the, uh, to the, to the detailing, uh, the pharmaceutical rep. They don't want to do that because that means a visit that they can't fill. Doctors are number, under enormous, um, enormous time stress. So mostly we have studied uh, advertising kinds of influences. In yeah. terms of reporting, so how much does it vary by sort of the state law and how, how much they have to get before they have to report any? You mean the pharmaceutical companies yeah. or, the, or the doctors? Both. Um, to my knowledge, doctors don't have to report this information. It's, the onus is on the pharmaceutical companies. And no, the answer is they have to report everything now. At least they have to report everything since the Sunshine Act in 2000, uh, yeah. prior to 2000, 2010, right? The women's yeah. effect in 2013. Um, many states, uh, not many, a handful of states, uh, Massachusetts, Vermont, Minnesota, several others, have had sunshine laws for longer. I think that the onus always was on the manufacturer to report that data, but I'm not 100% sure about that. Either. So we're going to try to understand, uh, we're going to try to understand um, how how changes to the incentives that physicians face to prescribe drugs is altering the decisions that the, uh, that the uh, manufacturers make to market to the physicians. Right? And uh, I'm, going to, I'm going to actually tell the story in reverse in that I'm going to tell you in advance sort of the why we care about seeing that relationship and then we'll look at, at the relationship rather than having the reason for the, uh, for the interest coming out of the theoretical model. Right? So um, why is it important? Well, uh, you may have heard of the, uh, the Sunshine Act that was passed at the federal level that requires manufacturers to report any gifts that they're giving to physicians, or any payments actually that they're making to physicians, even if it's just three pennies. And it's shocking how often you'll see less than a dollar recorded in, uh, on a line item. Um, this data is collected in, open, in what's called the Open Payments data set at openpayments.gov. You can uh, look it up. Some of you have the capacity now. Look up your doctor in it and see how much money your doctor is receiving from uh, every pharmaceutical company. The amount of money is quite large. So the two, in 2017, there was about $8.4 billion transferred from manufacturers directly to physicians um, or, or to healthcare providers. Uh, it takes several different forms. It used to be the case that Manufacturers would give um, would give providers uh, like doctors vacations to Hawaii or San Diego or places like that. Uh, that actually happens very rarely now, but they do oftentimes uh, give uh, give money for um, for being thought leaders. I don't. Uh, I was talking to one of you earlier today. I don't know how you become a thought leader, but it actually appears in the data to be a relatively lucrative position. So if you're a thought leader, you can get payments for being a thought leader. You can be. You can give. Uh, give speeches, um, you can uh, give, you know, do educational seminars to other people, you can have lunches paid for you, a whole host of ways that these manufacturers transfer money. Um, those, those that I just mentioned to you uh, make up the general payments amount of the open payments data. Again, about, about uh, well, $2.8 billion of the $8.4 billion are just these general payments. Uh, again, made, uh, made primarily to physicians. You'll see in just a minute how that breaks down. There are, uh, we have about $4.6, $4.7 billion that's made for research purposes. So if you're a physician who's helping oversee a clinical trial, let's say you've got 100 patients that you're taking part in a trial of a new drug, then you, of course, get compensated for that. Uh, the biggest chunk of the money is for those kinds of payments. Um, and also it turns out that if you're a physician that's involved with um, helping to develop the drug or the device such that you have an ownership share in the patent or some of the patents that go into protecting the device, you of course get, uh, get ownership transfers. And that's the smallest component, but still approaching a billion dollars. 
I'll tell you that in what we're doing moving forward today, we're going to be looking just at the general payments amount. We're not going to be asking how decisions are made that involve research payments, so enrolling, helping physicians enroll patients and things of that sort. Are yeah. these annual amounts? This is just in 2017. Okay. Yeah. So these are annual amounts. Uh, in terms of who's getting them, uh, you know, we have about uh, 628,000 physician entities that, uh, that receive payments. Uh, again, that amounts to about, about $2 billion. Teaching hospitals uh, receive about 700 and, uh, of the general, general payments, about 750. You see, again, the general hospitals are receiving the biggest bulk of the research money, which, is, uh, which makes sense. Um, and uh, actually, but the value of ownership, again, is mostly going to, uh, going to the physicians. I'm actually not sure why teaching hospitals don't seem to have ownership shares, but anyway, they, they don't. So, on the surface, the money that's flowing to these, uh, to, for marketing purposes, for, and again, marketing in the sense of two physicians, here's our direct either payments or in-kind subsidies, again, food is quite common, um, is big in and of itself. But, oh, and also, I should say, uh, not evenly distributed across the country. So this is a representation of the, uh, the average payment for just general payments to physicians on a sort of a, a per physician basis in the counties. And you see, of course, um, you in Southern California get, uh, get quite a bit. Uh, and then up in the, uh, the Northeast Corridor, there's a good bit as well. Less money flowing. To, and again, this is, this is population adjusted. So this less money is flowing to the central part uh, of the country compared to, to these regions. Now, you also know where I'm potentially going in just a minute, things like opioid uh, mortality and opioid abuse are happening in ways that are not evenly distributed across the country as well. That's where we might start to think, oh, there's more to it than just money. Yeah. So you said these are normalized per physician or per population? Per physician, okay. per physician. So this is essentially the total amount flowing into the county divided by the number of active physicians in the county. All right, and it flows in ways that, uh, that differ based on the kind of physicians. Um, we're, uh, this is coming from, um, this is a, there's a relationship here that we, that we uh, suspect, of course, the whole point that the pharmaceutical companies might do this sort of thing is they presumably hope that these payments will raise uh, prescribing rates. Um, and when we think about opiate-related uh, prescribing, looking at Medicare Part D data, and then this is coming from uh, work that, uh, that Tweed and Coastley and I have done on a different paper, is that we do in fact see that there is a sort of a positive association between the amount of money that physicians receive and the uh, amount of opiates that they prescribe, uh, but it varies quite a lot by specialty. Some specialties, uh, interventional pain medication, not, pain medicine specialists, not surprisingly, receive a lot of money and prescribe a lot of opiates, uh, whereas OBGYN uh, receives less money and, and, and prescribes fewer, fewer uh, opiates. Surgery, surprisingly, is, is uh, low on the list as well. And so we, we see a lot of money coming into the clinicians, an amount of money that is, um, is a significant proportion of the money we spend on prescription drugs uh, every year. We see that it seems to be associated with prescribing on the part of the physicians, and so we might worry that there's, uh, that there's some untoward aspects to it. And indeed, there's a lot of suspicion out there that there is, um, that there is um, uh, inappropriate, potentially inappropriate behavior as a consequence of this payment. And so um, the uh, drug manufacturer uh, INSYS has been accused of bribing several uh, clinicians um, uh, INSYS is the um, manufacturer of, the primary manufacturer of fentanyl. You guys know uh, fentanyl is a, an opiate that's received a lot of attention in recent years. So uh, they have been uh, accused of, uh, of bribing doctors to prescribe fentanyl off-label, and um, six of the uh, executives were arrested as a consequence of this. So, What journal is this, BMJ? This is the British Medical Journal. You guys have seen that I have a jacket, so I'm going to take it off. <laughs> um, yeah, the British Medical Journal. This is actually, the British Medical Journal has got uh, like a news section. Just, this is not an academic uh, article. It's just a news report about fentanyl. Yeah. So is there an appropriate way to bribe doctors to prescribe fentanyl? <laughs> From the, the, the headline, it seems a little bit... Uh, 
Oh. <laughs> um, yeah, I, well, I think inappropriate is modifying uh, prescribe, not bribe. So. Oh, I see. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think they construct the sentence a little bit better. I, I agree with you. <laughs> um, uh, as a side note, uh, sort of linked to some of the other work that I do, uh, uh, I, uh, uh, along with my co-author Ashley and, and uh, some others at UGA, have been doing some work on medical cannabis uh, as well. And it turns out that fentanyl in Arizona was the largest contributor in 2016 uh, to the anti-cannabis uh, liberalization uh, movement. There was a ballot initiative to legalize cannabis in Arizona. The manufacturer of fentanyl was the largest contributor to the anti-legalization uh, uh, effort there in Arizona. And by the way, Arizona was the only state in 2016 of eight or nine that had ballot initiatives. That's the only one that didn't pass the ballot initiative. So it's very interesting, uh, very interesting side note there. So, so, so is there evidence that pharmaceutical companies that are prescribing, you know, particular types of opioids like like fentanyl that they obviously they, they, they should worry about targeting. Right? Yeah, but they're yeah, just yeah. going after the physicians who were doing this in the same way. You know, yep. Campaign contributors go after politicians who might have voted that way anyway, yep. supporting people yeah, on, just their, on right. their side. Yeah, that's right. So, so, uh, so, so, have they found, for instance, that that that, that this is that, that the contributions from particular pharmaceutical companies for particular types of drugs are 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 increasing, but not sort of the the class of drugs, you know, other types of opioids in this class. So, uh, is, you're asking is the association between gifts, gifts received and prescribing weaker for some class, some opiates and stronger for others? Yeah, that, that, that's right. And do you see the effect for the person where, where you're able to identify the contributions for the particular, you know, a, a more specific sort of type yeah. of drug? Yeah, so yeah. you can sort of see whether it's, it's to try at least descriptively see whether it's targeting or whether you actually think we're driving a, 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 partic a particular set of prescriptions. Sure. Uh, so, so the paper that uh, that graph by specialty was taken from, that Cosley and Twee and I have worked on, did look at association. We, we it's the, like our strategy with that line of inquiry is first pass at health affairs type publication. Uh, actually, it's coming out in addiction, I think, um, and then a more detailed economic model that takes all the econometrics of causality seriously. So the associations from our first pass paper do differ substantially by type of drug. We looked at uh, hydrocodone, oxycodone, morphine, uh, fentanyl, and uh, maybe just to catch all others. Uh, hydrocodone was by far the, the associations were by far the strongest for hydrocodone. Not trivial, however. I mean, there was associations across the board. So fentanyl was one that, that did in fact respond. But as I recall it, the biggest response was in hydrocodone. All right, so we, we might worry, right? We might worry that, uh, that physicians are being induced to prescribe uh, for, pay, for reasons uh, other than their assessment of the clinical need uh, for the patient, right? And if that inducement is happening, of course, it's one-sided, right? It's, it's to prescribe more. Uh, it would be a, a weird situation when the pharmaceutical company would incentivize physicians to prescribe less. I will say, by the way, um, that this is getting a lot of attention sort of in policy circles to the point that pharmaceutical manufacturers are beginning to react. Just this year, Purdue uh, Pharmaceuticals that makes OxyContin announced that it would no longer uh, provide any marketing, this sort of detailing or any other, on behalf of any of their opioid, man, uh, opioid products. So the, the, um, the manufacturers are starting to get worried about the appearance. Yeah. Wasn't your daughter looking at the effects of detailing on opioid overdoses? Yeah. Where that is standing right now. Yeah, she, she is looking at that. So thank you for asking. Uh -huh. uh, and uh, so this is currently, uh, the paper is currently under revision. And she has found a large positive association uh, uh, between these detailing dollar flows and uh, opiate mortality. Positive in the sense of more opiate mortality when more money is flowing in. Um, and at the moment, she's trying to, I mean, it was a straightforward sort of diff and diff that she was doing. I, I, actually, no, not diff and diff because there's no policy change there. Um, she's trying to nail down the IV a bit more, a bit more carefully. But, I will say that the effect sizes are, are of a magnitude and significance level that it would be a remarkable level of endogeneity bias that would push it away from at least some positive and significant effect. So there does seem to be this association with, uh, which I think is 
and we'll, you'll, I think we'll see that oh, there's, there's reasons to think that these payments are in fact strategically going and maybe going to the kinds of physicians that could be inducing, could be at least thought to be supplying a bit of the, uh, a bit of the spillovers to the illicit and abusive use market that is the high volume prescribers. But yeah, she is finding that. Other questions? All right, so opiates and, op and opiate mortality. We're going to be focusing on the payments to, uh, from opiate manufacturers uh, to physicians um, and how those change as you make it harder for physicians to prescribe opiates. But why do we, why again do we care about this? This is uh, heat map, this is straight, straightforward from the, the CDC uh, drug, accidental drug overdose. I will say this is uh, because the CDC does a better job at making these heat maps than I do. I'm just using theirs. This is all uh, accidental drug deaths. This does include things like cocaine and methamphetamine. If you just pull the opiate, it's going to look nearly exactly the same. So the, the, the oh, I didn't, I didn't copy the, the legend. The legend would be slightly different scale, but it's going to have sort of the same effect. So in 2000, you see there's a little pocket of, um, of uh, higher levels of accidental drug overdoses and if we saw it, uh, opiate overdoses uh, in Central Appalachian and then, and then one uh, in uh, New Mexico. And if we fast forward to 2016, we can see that there is this intense section of uh, accidental drug overdoses beginning now to, uh, to uh, accelerate in New England um, and really taking off, uh, taking off in the West as well. Again, it looks the same for opiates. The most recent estimates that have just come out last week uh, for 2017 uh, look m worse yet. So we've not yet seen the crest of this wave. I'm sorry, I missed the year of the first map. 2000. 2000. So this is a 16 year, 16 year change on the same scale. So the dark here represents, I think, um, I think 28 or 30 deaths per 100,000 or higher. So uh, again, really, really intense problem. With. And, and, and also last week, at the same time, the CDC has sort of released their, um, their projections of 70,000 or so <laughs> accidental drug deaths uh, nationally uh, for 2017. We also saw for the second year in a row uh, reductions in ex uh, life expectancy at birth, right? So uh, this is having enormous, uh, enormous effects. And it's just, uh, I, I think, unprecedented for a developed country to see reductions, you know, year-on-year -year reductions in life expectancy at birth. So, very serious problem. Many people believe are attributed to uh, the opioid crisis. Now, I do want to say uh, one thing that I should have said at the very beginning is, um, I think I've mentioned this uh, it's, uh, one or two of my meetings earlier today. I'm going to be leading you down the same potential primrose lane that everybody else does by implicitly assuming that it's obvious that the increase that we've seen in opiate prescribing in the legitimate market, that is where physicians write you a prescription, you go to a CVS and fill it, right? That that increase, which we increased dramatically um, in terms of numbers of prescriptions until about 2011, 2012, and continued to increase in terms of number of morphine milligram equivalent doses until 2013, 2014, that that increase is in fact causally associated with opiate overdose mortality. For those of you looking for research projects, let me say that's actually not been established. It's a very compelling case that we've seen this huge increase in licit prescribing and we've seen a huge increase in opiate, opiate overdose deaths, but no one has actually, to my knowledge, done a, tried or attempted really to do a good job of asking is that the causal effect or are there just other things that are sort of book driving both of these things Contemporaneously, so it may be one big. Uh, uh, what's the name of the fallacy? Uh, 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 because because in advance, after I can't remember the Latin for it off the top of my head. Post hoc ergo prompter hoc. There it is, right? It may be one big fallacy. So um, someone needs to, to nail that down. And if any of you uh, enterprising students are uh, thinking about projects, that's a good one, I think. Is it the licit market or not? I don't know. All right, but nonetheless, here's uh, just one more picture of, about opiate overdose deaths. Um, again, prescription uh, opiates, uh, overdose deaths. This is broken out by the way where blue is our, our rural counties, uh, red is urban counties, and green is metropolitan counties. We saw that we actually had kind of a peak around 2011, 2012 before taking off again. Why did it take off again? The answer is uh, to be found in the, uh, the deaths from 
drugs that could be uh, that could be synthetic opiates. This is primarily fentanyl uh, and deaths associated with heroin, both of which spiked up uh, right around 2013 when there were significant uh, retrenchments in the availability of um, unfortunate retrenchments in the availability of prescription drugs uh, and, and clamp downs that were put in place on that and what appears to be a simultaneous access uh, by the drug cartels to fentanyl, either because they've gotten access to overseas uh, active uh, pharmaceutical ingredients or have learned to synthesize it themselves. Nonetheless, fentanyl, an extraordinarily potent uh, uh, opiate, about a uh, hundred times more potent than morphine, right, um, is now mixed with nearly all opiate and even indeed non-opiate related uh, drugs on the market now. Uh, fentanyl is terrifying. Um, there's another derivative called carfentanyl that has recently made its way into the um, into the illicit market, which is, believe it or not, 10,000 times more potent than morphine. Uh, it's actually used for a large animal like elephant sedation, but it's also made its way into the, the drug supply. Uh, actually, I was talking with um, with a, a person in Athens who's active in trying to help on, in a public health sense. Uh, contain drug abuse and overdose in the Athens area. So she's sort of on the ground. And one of the things she's been doing is uh, securing fentanyl test strips that she's passing out to people that she knows are on the street using drugs and testing the drugs for them. And she said that she's, uh, her, well, sort of, again, not statistically validated, but back of the uh, envelope is that every sample she's tested for the past six months or so of anything, whether it's, whether it's uh, heroin, whether it's uh, ecstasy, any of the drugs she's tested, she said, with the exception of uh, LSD, though I don't know how she would get a hands to test that, but um, all of it has been contaminated with fentanyl. So it's a, it's a serious, serious problem. It's very hard to, uh, to titrate the dose effect. A million doses of fentanyl, will, of pure fentanyl, will fix, fit in the size of something like a shoebox. So it gives you a feel for uh, how easy it is to transport it from the southern border to Vermont, for example, where they're having big problems with fentanyl overdose deaths. All right, so um, should we be concerned about this then, a link between these payments made to, uh, to physicians um, and uh, overdose deaths? And there is literature that suggests that we should. So uh, there's uh, this work by uh, De Jong and others. Oh, you see my facility with femur. Um, is <laughs> a, a study, uh, a large number of physicians, actually the first wave of the data that I'm going to be, that we're going to be using today. Uh, and they found that, um, that physicians who received even a, a, a single meal uh, promoting a drug or interest had significantly higher, higher rates. Uh, another su similar study found that even, you know, the $13 average meal uh, increases opiate prescribing rates. So this was sort of looking at statins. We have one that looks at opiates. The payments seem to be associated with higher higher rates. Um, uh, as I said, uh, Twee Kosley and I have a paper that not, finds these associations as well. Uh, but hopefully we'll have a causal story about that. Uh, yes, so, so, yeah. so, so, so what you sort of take on is, right, about whether a lunch, uh, I mean, I don't, I don't have the sort of magnitudes of the effects of the increase in opioid prescribing, but how plausible do you think it is that a, that you know a single lunch that's even th you know thirteen dollars is sort of driving the yeah whether this is just or whether this is just picking up the tar the the, the, the the selection the targeting of the position? That's a good question, uh, and I would say that uh, I don't know that any of the studies that have been done, including ours, would. Be able, would be, certainly would not be able to differentiate selection, right? That we're selecting people who are going to be prescribing in way. Nor would it actually pick up whether the margin is merely on the extensive rather than the intensive margin, right? There are a lot of doctors who get zero, right? right? And, so, uh, right. and so what we may be seeing is, oh, getting something mm. matters as opposed to getting $13. Right? Mm. So there's, there's plenty of zeros out mm. It's actually kind of tricky, as, I'll, as I think I'll mention a little bit later. Um, making sure you've got the, the denominator right on this is actually not easy because uh, the government has made it as hard as possible to actually use this data for, uh, for analysis. All right, so um, how have states responded to this opioid crisis and, again, the implicit, though not demonstrated, connection between licit prescribing and abuse or and illicit ab abuse and mortality. Well, states have kind of just taken a shotgun to it, right? They've thrown everything at the wall to see if something potentially will stick. 
They've used prescription drug monitoring programs, which we're going to talk about today. They've used uh, doctor shopping restrictions to say, even though it has always been illegal to seek uh, multiple prescriptions from multiple physicians, some laws have now been put in place that, um, that explicitly make this uh, an illegal thing to do for controlled substances and an opiate. Uh, they've tried to have additional oversight from large prescribers, so called pill mills. Right? This was particularly a problem uh, in Florida. We, we make jokes about Florida, uh, but actually, in this case, it was a real problem in Florida. I don't know if you guys, maybe you don't do it on the West that Coast. That's a joke. Oh, <laughs> well, no, I mean, you know, there was a story, for example, uh, uh, this is not a joke, this is true, of a guy who tried to rob a liquor store, or like a, a liquor store, and he had an alligator under his arm, and he, he chased people around with the alligator, and then robbed, robbed the store, and then went and left the alligator, and somehow came back to get more or something, and got arrested as a consequence. So that's Florida, right? And those of us in the East, we know Florida. But uh, this actually was, was Florida, a Florida story. Um, Limits on the quantity of opiates prescribed, a whole host of things states have thrown at it simultaneously to see whether or not they can get some control of it. I will say that most of the literature on these attempts is very pessimistic about whether it's had uh, any impact. Uh, there was a good study in uh, JAMA IM conducted by Hel um, Ellen Mira, I think. I think it was she, and co authors. It tested a bunch of them at the same time with a pretty good different diff design with a sort of overlapping overlapping policy initiations and really couldn't find that any of these things had much effect. So have there been have there been sorry have yeah. there been have there been limits on the size of gifts that the that, that states have adopted so in addition to the sunshine laws? In in very recent time I think uh, Massachusetts I think like really recently in 2017 um, adopted a policy that limited the kinds of um, pins and cups and ties and things that you can get. So you're not able, if you're a manufacturer, to leave a pen with a doctor that has both your your uh, manufacturer name and the drug's name on it, right? So as if a pen with, you know, Lipitor is somehow <laughs> going to uh, prompt the doctor to change behavior, but they think that it will, right? But there's been some limits to that. I'm not aware of others. All right, so we're going we're gonna to focus today on uh, these prescription drug monitoring programs, in part because we think that the, one of these are very, very widely adopted. Uh, and until 2017, only Missouri, Missouri sort of stood alone as the only state without a prescription drug monitoring program. But these prescription drug monitoring programs also vary in the uh, degree to which they might actually bite in terms of physician behavior and actually might constrain the physicians in ways that I'll, I'll mention uh, in just a minute. So, uh, okay. so what is a PDMP? Uh, so prescription drug monitoring programs are these databases that are operated uh, by the states that are attempting to provide in more information to physicians to allow the physician to prescribe more appropriately. I think, uh, as with many things, I think California was the first state to adopt P uh, PDMP many, many decades ago. This was a paper-based PDMP where physicians would send uh, information on their prescriptions to the uh, public health agency of the state, and it would go into a file cabinet in the basement in, I don't know, Sacramento or something like that, right? Um, uh, over time, because that's not, that's not at all helpful for physicians in their decision making, so over time states have begun to turn these into electronic PDMPs. And the modern literature trying to understand the impact of PDMPs is exclusively focused, almost exclusively focused on uh, whether or not a state had an electronic PDMP in place or not, so that physicians could in fact access it. What goes into the PDMP? It's the patient's name, uh, it's the, uh, the the prescriber's name, it's the drug that was prescribed, when, how much, how many refills, things of that point. Um, states vary in how they expect providers to access the data. Some states allow non-providers to access the data. Third party payers can access in some states. Police departments can access in some states, right? But uh, there's, a, there's a variation in what states are going to do. I'm going to show you some ways that this varies uh, a little bit later. The goal is to try to help clinicians uh, Pre uh, prevent problematic behavior. That is, if my PDMP requires that I um, check, uh, check the database before I write a prescription and I do so and I see that my patient has just yesterday gotten a prescription for an opiate from another doctor and the day before that gotten a prescription for an opiate from yet a third doctor, then I can refuse the prescription or at least have some conversation with my patient about 
uh, uh, substance abuse treatment, right? Uh, so that's the goal of, of this thing. Um, they vary a lot in terms of whether or not uh, people uh, access them or, 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 um, uh, or, or sign up for them even. What have we found? The earliest literature found small, champ small benefits of PDMP in terms of uh, improving uh, prescribing rates, that is reducing opiate prescribing rates. I would say that most of the uh, most current literature has found, generally speaking, this, um, this uh, is there an electronic PDMP or not, uh, have to have no effect. But uh, there's a paper out by uh, Buck Mueller and Carey uh, from uh, just this year that has looked at uh, mandate that must access uh, PDMP, so which is what we're going to look at uh, in just a minute. Uh, and have found that, in fact, those uh, can be effective at reducing opiate prescribing. So, um, what's a must-access uh, PDMP? This is a PDMP that requires physicians to look at the data before they write a prescription and to report all of their data to a to, uh, prescribing entity. Now, this is, at best, kind of a fuzzy, a fuzzy thing. Georgia, just this year, converted from a voluntary PDMP to a must-access PDMP. We always had a must-enroll PDMP, right? So for many years, Georgia has required physicians to enroll in the PDMP, even though they didn't have to access the data, but they had to enroll and report the data. When we started converting over in January 1st of this year, uh, they handed uh, administration over to another agency who did an audit, and even though we were required to have must-enroll, there were only 30% of physicians in the state that actually had complied with the law and had enrolled in the must-enroll PDMP. Um, very little evidence of access. Starting in, in June or July of this year, physicians both had to enroll and had to access it. So we'll wait and see how quickly they roll it out. But we're going to be turning these things on as soon as they go into effect legally. Be aware, however, that there's a there's a definitely a, a burn-in period. Is, is the, the mechanism people have in mind sort of information that when they're forced to access it, they're sort of learning more about the patient's history, or is it fear of penalty from uh, you know, over prescribing or what 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 is what, what what's hypothesized to be the primary mechanism through which the must access uh, program is does seem to be driving reductions in prescribing I think the primary hypothesized mechanism is information that physicians being forced to see it will then act on the data right and which may be the reason we're seeing such poor uh, poor outcomes <clears throat> is there really any change in the liability that's gone up along with these PDMP? Because that would be one way to tease out these two hypotheses, right? Because no. observa there will be observational equivalent, um, <clears throat> you know, in, in these two worlds. The only thing would be if you also had variation in, in who's kind of liable. If it's, I now know, I worry that now I'm, my doctor friend is going to see that I'm overprescribed it, and, you know, maybe that matters more if, if I can get sued or something like that. Yeah, that's a great question. I don't know, I actually don't know the answer to that question. But I think it's definitely one, I mean, you do see, you do see in the uh, professional literature, not, not the academic literature, but the professional literature, prescribers worried that they're now more easily monitored and therefore more likely to be uh, sort of sanctioned by DEA or by others because of these. Right? Mm -hmm. But I, um, I don't know to the extent that there are simultaneous state law changes that come into play. Federal law would, would always sort of prevent doctors from, from uh, prescribing inappropriately, but you know, not that many physicians are sanctioned each year by the DEA or Health and Human Services, though something like 3,000 or so are. Right? So every year, 3,000 or so uh, prescribing entities lose the right to participate in federal programs uh, because, of, uh, because of their behavior. Also, data that's really available for those of you who are interested in uh, studying uh, HHS exclusions. Quite interesting. And I should mention again, for those of you students who are interested, uh, I think something like 15 states, I don't know if anyone knows the exact number, 15 states say that they make their PDMP data, the actual data, line item, patient, pres uh, doctor, prescribing uh, information available to researchers upon request, de-identified, so patient IDs, doctor IDs that are scrambled that you can't, that you can link, but you can't uh, track them to anybody. Um, I, one of our former students at UGA, Red Smith, uh, who some of you may see him present some uh, medical cannabis work at the conferences. Uh, I think he's gotten data from about 15 state PDMP. So that's actually available, which I think is uh, something that's underexploited. So something you should, you should guys think about uh, about looking into. All right. So um, 
These PDMPs can vary in the degree to which they constrain physicians or, in our language, impose costs on physicians for choosing to prescribe an opiate. You know, typically, uh, what's the physician's cost for prescribing an opiate, thinking about it, and signing a prescription pad, right? Um, now, you might think that that's a very low cost, but actually, it turns out there's a lot of weird literature that suggests that if you want to do generic substitution back in the 80s, and you made doctors check a box and sign for generic substitution, that extra cost of checking actually changed generic substitution quite a lot. <laughs> so uh, doctors are very responsive to, to cost changes. Uh, PDMPs go further than that. If you want to write a prescription for a must-access PDMP, then you must access the PDMP. You must go in and look at it or at least have uh, someone with prescribing authority like a physician extender or a nurse go in and check it. If you prescribe, you then must enter the data into the PDMP. Right? So every time you choose to do a PDMP, this has got to happen. How often does it have to happen? It varies. In some, in some states, North Carolina, Pennsylvania, uh, Oregon, this is real time. As soon as you do it, you've got to enter the data uh, into the uh, into the PDMP. Other places, Florida, again, of course, uh, this is a weekly thing where you've got a week to actually uh, uh, actually enter the uh, the data. So again, it sort of limits the one limits the utility of it, but also limits the uh, the cost imposed of it on it. Uh, states vary in what they uh, what they require. Schedule, you know, scheduled drugs or drugs that are listed in the Controlled Substances Act. Schedule 1 are the drugs that are, are considered to have absolutely no medically accepted uses and a high potential for abuse. Things like heroin, LSD, and cannabis. Right? Three things that are, and peyote. Three things that are, four things that are lumped together. Um, at least the cannabis one, uh, and actually, frankly, LSD, both have medically accepted uses. So it should be rescheduled, but our Attorney General has not been interested in doing that. Uh, maybe the new guy will. Who knows? <laughs> Sort of a random number generator, maybe he'll come out. <laughs> uh, so, uh, Schedule 2 are uh, drugs like, uh, so, so shockingly, right? Uh, cannabis is a Schedule 1, absolutely prohibited in all cases. Um, uh, Schedule 2 drugs are things like methamphetamine. That's okay, you can prescribe that if you want to. Uh, so, uh, Schedule 2 drugs are the, uh, sort of the, the most severe that you could, um, that you could uh, prescribe. So again, methamphetamine, cool, um, cannabis, not. Uh, so uh, some states require that you monitor all of them through Schedule 5, which is the least restrictive, and, and again, we have variations. You'll notice in the center of our country, Missouri, standing out here. Um, shockingly, and I put this only up here because I find it uh, humorous, um, some PDMP laws say you must access it. Other PDMP laws actually explicitly say you don't have to. Uh, so these are the states that actually say, we're going to have a PDMP, but we're going to explicitly give you permission not to use it if you don't want to. Right. I'm not going to obviously be bringing this information to bear, but uh, I don't want to miss the opportunity to be snarky about, uh, well, actually, Georgia, but never mind. Um, <laughs> all right, so let me talk very briefly about, uh, or maybe not very briefly, I can't seem to do that, but I'm actually going to try to be brief, so I want to get to our empirical results. I'm going to tell you how we can theoretically conceptualize this, all right? Uh, and again, uh, I'll go, I'll start talking fast just because I want to get through to the data. However, if you're interested in this, we'll talk about this, and I can fast forward to the, to the results uh, with uh, a minute left in today's talk if necessary. So, so drive it as we want. So we wanted to actually, rather than just say, oh, well, whatever, there's some mechanism, we really wanted to try to remember that we're economists and think a little carefully about what might be driving the process. And so we're going we're gonna to propose uh, the first stage of what I, I think we want to pursue a little in a little bit more detail because you'll see that there's a lot of things that as economists seem surprising that we're waving our hands around like we're not going to have demand curves here for now but I think introducing demand curves would actually be quite interesting in terms of understanding how this process unfolds so our first pass is just is there a link between constraining physicians in terms of what they can prescribe and what the incentives are for the manufacturers to give them money right that's our remember that's our primary question so we're going to think about a highly stylized model of decision making. As I said, we're going to abstract away from competitive issues between physicians. Right? We're going to abstract away, for now, from uh, demand. So uh, to justify it, you can say, well, the patients, when they're getting these prescriptions, are largely fully insured. If there's a copayment, it's a small copayment. Their demand response is probably not driving uh, the decisions for um, uh, uh, not being heavily driven by the co-payments, that's a stretch, I realize that, but that's what we're saying at the moment. Um, physicians are not getting more or less 
for the services they provide based upon their prescribing decisions. That's actually not really much of a stretch. Uh, third party payment reimbursements, uh, Medicare, Medicaid reimbursements, even private pay patients don't pay more if they get a prescription. Physicians don't get directly paid for that. Actually, it's against the law for physicians to get paid more to do a prescription in, in this country or, or sell the prescriptions and unless they actually are, are physician administered drugs, right? Only a small portion of the pot of physicians get paid for the prescriptions they're writing. So the theoretical framework is going to be really simple. Pharmaceutical companies are going to set the rules saying, here's how we're going to give you payments, and we're going to give you payments that are related to the amount of prescriptions that you write. Now you may ask yourself, you may ask me, is that a reasonable thing to assume? And I would say institutionally, you bet it is. Because these detail, and these pharmaceutical representatives never go into a physician's office to bring them lunch or to to give them, I don't know, an envelope stuffed with money, however this happens, right? They never go in without first reviewing reports on that individual physician that are generated by companies like IMS Health that track exactly how many prescriptions the physician has written over the last period of time for that specific drug that the rep is marketing, right? So these reps absolutely know what the physicians are prescribing before they go into the visit. The, fam the manufacturers do. There's a huge infrastructure and literally hundreds of millions of dollars exchange to provide this information to the manufacturers. Uh, so they absolutely know um, and whether the agreement of here's the correspondence between your prescribing and our gifts is explicit or implicit really doesn't matter. Right? All right, so we're going to assume that the pharmaceutical companies set the rules and then the physicians respond and choose what their optimal prescribing uh, rate is going to be. Right? And, and of course to do this we're going to uh, do it in reverse, solve it in reverse order. So really simple, you know, I, you know, I, I, I thought when, when, when Joe asked me, I thought, well, this is an economics uh, audience and they're going to think this is too simplistic, but oh, well, whatever. I'm, I'm flying back to Georgia tomorrow, so uh, there's a limited <laughs> damage you can do to me. So we're going to just characterize um, the patients as being arrayed along a unit interval where uh, Patients uh, to the far left with the theta, this is the parameter of the interval, of zero are going to be the best matches. That is, we're getting worse and worse matches as we move to one. The patient uh, arrayed here is the worst possible match. What do we mean by the worst possible match? Let's propose the simplest possible framework for that. That is that patients receive some benefit from the opiate pain reduction, right? And the patient with the best match gets some fixed uh, some maximum benefit from the opiate receipt. Assume a very simple linear model. We tried nonlinear models. The answers are the same, they're just a lot more complicated <laughs> to figure out, right? Um, so that as we go to worse and worse matches, patients get less and less clinical benefit from it. The best patient nonetheless receives, while receiving benefit from the drug, may nonetheless face some harm associated with it, some probability that they get put on a path to misuse and abuse and maybe even mortality. But the worst matched patient, of course, has the highest probability or the highest expected harm associated with using the drug, patients with history of substance abuse, things of that sort. So we've got these two simple models that cross, and of course, here's the patient that would receive zero net clinical benefit. That's not going to necessarily, that's not going to, um, except by chance, be the actual outcome that the patient, that the physician chooses. So then we're going to think about the net clinical benefit as simply being the difference between these two, where B is just going to be G minus, uh, G bar minus H bar, right? And this is the, the penalty that we pay uh, as you move further and further away from being the best match patient uh, for, for getting a prescription. If that's the case, then the average treatment effect, the sort of the average treatment effect on the treated is just going to be um, the benefit accruing to the best patient, which is just B, uh, plus the benefit accruing to the marginal patient divided by 2, which gives us, gives us this expression, which is going to be something we're going to use when we think about the, the physician's decision calculus. Right? So the physician we're going to assume, and this is where, I won't talk really fast because you're economist, but this is where I'm, I'm ignoring demand curves, right? We're going to assume that the physician faces a constant flow of patients in. Every patient comes into the practice with some complaint. The decision that the physician uh, makes is whether to give that patient a prescription or not. That's it, right? That's all the choice that's happening here. What's the physician going to get? The physician's going to get revenue. And there's no price is not declining. So this is, you can think of this as price minus marginal cost here for actually providing the visit. And then the physician has got some strength of preference for patient health, and we're going to assume the physician is maximizing across the average uh, health for the patients who get the prescriptions. 
How many patients get prescriptions? Theta times n. Theta being not only the match, but also the proportion of patients that get a prescription. So theta times n are the number of uh, patients getting a prescription. This is the average benefit, the average treatment effect on the treated patients, and alpha represents the physician's strength of preference for patient health. So the physician's maximizing across his or her own income and patient health, trying to increase both if possible. In simple, straightforward calculus at that point, we've got a condition for the optimal, uh, the marginal patient, the marginal match. And as I said, in general, this is not going to be the patient where we've got, uh, where we've got net benefits equal zero. Right? It's going to be probably somewhere to the, to the left of that. All right, so that's, a, that's in a world, by the way, I should point out where you don't see anything here about PDMP. So this is our base model. There is no PDMP. The physician doesn't bear any cost for writing a prescription, right? And there isn't any payment from the pharmaceutical company. Uh, you could work this out assuming no PDMP, but a payment from the pharmaceutical company, the optimal payment in that case is, uh, is, is uh, zero, right? So you're not, you're not doing better, right? So um, let's then put in place a PDMP and a manufacturer uh, payment. How am I conceptualizing that? Uh, again, we're going to assume that the PDMP costs delta uh, per patient. That's theta times n of the number of patients that are, that are prescribed. Delta can be zero if there is no PDMP. You can think about no PDMP as a delta equals zero world. And as, del as the PDMP goes from a every week to every two days to every day to uh, schedule two only to schedule three, you know, we can get more and more intensive PDMP. So delta becomes the intensity of PDMP, and omega, theta are the payments that the manufacturer gets from the pharmaceutical company. Omega is the rule that the pharmaceutical company is going to set in just a minute about, uh, about how much to pay the physician, assuming physicians who prescribe more get more, right? You can work out, you can make other assumptions, but all of those are worse for the pharmaceutical company. They never do anything other than this. All right, so what do we find here? We find that we're going to get, as it turns out, more prescribing uh, uh, when we've got this, uh, the PDMP in place and a payment under the conditions that, that, this, um, that this is actually larger. Uh, you can get, you can get uh, circumstances under which uh, this is larger than, uh, than the base case, right? So that condition is going to, I'm oh, sorry, never mind. Um, this is the rule. We're going to use this rule. This is the physician's reaction function. I'm, I'm not doing it. I've got to give you the answer in just a couple of minutes. So we have a physician reaction function um, that depends upon their strength, of, physician's strength of preference for, uh, for the patient health, the cost for every patient uh, for prescribing a PDMP, and then sort of the average reimbursement they're getting per, per patient. So that reaction function gets thrown into the manufacturer's objective function. And again, what are we assuming uh, for the manufacturer? They're going to maximize profits across, uh, across K strategically independent physicians. The physicians aren't competing with each other. Again, the I.O. is out the window at this point, right? That makes our life really simple because all we have to do is think about the conditions for one, uh, one physician in this case. So they're going to set the rule for, uh, for Omega, the payment uh, of taking the reaction function uh, into account, get positive payments, uh, generally speaking. How much is going to go to the physician? Well, it's, here's the rule that was set. It's the, it's the pharmaceutical company's reaction to the physician behavior times the physician behavior. Ultimately, the question boils down to, are we getting more payments with a PDMP or less? Which is going to depend upon the sign of that term. Yes. Sorry, I'm not quite tracking here. Is the... Yeah, go so really fast. Are you <laughs> plugging in your, your solution in theta into the pharmaceutical company's yes. objective function? Yes. So wouldn't it be more natural to solve for a Nash equilibrium where they don't know a priori what, the, what they're doing? Well, the, yes, you could absolutely set up a simultaneous move game like that. We've actually, again, for simplicity's sake, assumed a sequential game where the pharmaceutical company sets the rules based on their expectations of the physician behavior and the physician then reacts to it. So them. I guess my question would be if you, if you treat it as a simultaneous game, do you get sub any kind of substantive differences in the solutions? Because Yeah, I don't know. Because I think that that kind of matters. I think that would be a more natural way because of, of sort of a more realistic way mm -hmm. of modeling it because 
uh, unless you're going to do it in a dynamic setting, right? Because yeah, no, you, you're sort of you don't want to do that, right? So I mean, this would be I don't. It doesn't seem like the math would be that much more difficult. And if it doesn't matter, then who cares? Just go with this and just have a footnote that says if we model it in this other way, we don't get any substantive differences in our results. But if it does affect things, then, then that's obviously, yeah, that's, that's a good point. We since we, have, since we haven't gotten to the empirical stuff, I'm not quite sure how important this is to frame your results. Okay. Are you, are you leaning on this to actually pin down mechanisms, or are, do the results kind of stand on their own? If they stand on their own, it's a moot point. Right. I hope but if you're I using hope, this. Yeah, yeah. I hope that it doesn't stand on their own. And let me just jump to, since I, I am running out of time, and I and I, you're right, I'm going too fast for you to follow the, the, even this simple math anyway. Let me just say, here's why I, here's why we did it because we do think that we get some prediction out of this, two of which matter as far as our specification goes. The first is that um, the that under the under sort of the conditions about the you know the average. The average net benefit to the physician in terms of writing a prescription relative to the average payment they're getting from the pharmaceutical companies, we should in fact see that when states impose PMPs under a wide range of circumstances, we're going to get fewer uh, fewer dollars flowing to those those physicians. As manufacturers looking around the states say, everything else equal, I'm going to drive my money to states without PMPs because I've got less to overcome in that case, right? Except that that effect is less likely to be true with large practices. So big physicians actually might see an increase in their money flowing to them from the manufacturers if, they're, if they prescribe lots of drugs, um, even in states with PDMPs. That we think we learned from the model. Now, therefore, it's, I think even for a simple model like this, it's important to get it right. So I take your point about modeling it alternatively as a simultaneous move game, right, which we can do. But so we, we, we think what we're seeing is that we expect a negative association between PDMPs and, and payments, but with large firms, with large prescribers, we actually might see an offsetting positive effect. It could indeed at some level outweigh the negative, the negative effect uh, for the PDMPs. Um, and we also, though we haven't looked at this yet, we also would say that whether or not the PDMPs rise or fall is actually going to depend upon whether the drug has a high value, relative, uh, high value clinically relative to its purchase price. Right? So that's what we, we haven't figured out how to do yet. Yeah. So I wonder if we, if we could just take another moment and talk about the intuition behind the second point. I think the first point is, is pretty straightforward, right? Mm -hmm. they increase the cost, physicians are going to prescribe less, it becomes less profitable. You know, that, I don't think that's particularly surprising. Yeah. Uh, but the fact that, that you can get this not only is it that you know the the magnitude differs by n, but the the sign can differ by n. Mm -hmm. I mean, I can tell a couple st stories and you know about you know why it depending on you know if you have a couple large firms and some small firms within a state that there might be some shifting away from the small prescribers to the big prescribers or something like that. If you have a story about kind of yeah, I don't think that, that's sort of consistent with with this idea. So uh, yeah, but so. How are you guys thinking about this? The fact that you can actually get these these differential effects, or like but different signs on these effects, like it just in terms of the, just the economic. I mean, I know we have the model, and I but yeah, yeah. you know. So um, so why, why should we believe? Uh, yeah okay. yeah yeah. So um, so again, uh, where we're thinking about pushing the model a little bit to see if we can develop more intuition about mm -hmm. this. One obvious way that you could imagine it is that. There are economies of scale associated with with prescribing when you have this sort of fixed cost PDMP. So I, if I'm a large prescriber, mm -hmm. can afford to hire physician extenders that can do the PDMP interaction for me. Whereas if I'm a small prescriber, I won't. And as a small prescriber, then I may have a much larger negative response to this delta cost than if I'm a large prescriber. But that actually would require us to think about delta then being a function of yeah, yeah, this not so. an end it's thing not say, it's, it's not you have two firms who are facing different deltas. Yeah, right. So we yeah. could think about uh, you know as we as we pursue this more and try to explore, try to think about what is a good as you say this is this to some degree algebra, but we need to have a story for why we would believe that algebra. Right. That's one possible way of thinking about it. Um, you know, at at the moment, uh, it's just uh, it's just the case that you know the penalty that you um, that you uh, pay for um, the penalty that you pay uh, for 
undertaking uh, a prescription for an opiate, even in the face of the PDMP, is easier to overcome if you're if you're getting um, if you're getting. Well, I'm telling a story that's going the other direction. And I was about to say it's easier to overcome if you're getting uh, less money per patient, but that doesn't make any sense. I'm gonna have to think about that. Okay. Yeah. Are you, I wonder, you know, I mean, especially given kind of your you know background and your unique role, if. You, if have you talked to um, either physicians or places that are doing a lot of this prescribing to see kind of how they have reacted to these these PDMP laws? Have have they hired people to be full time data entry specialists, or is it that you know places of a certain size they already have some kind of administrative staff that they can put on that? Yeah, um, I have. Okay, uh, and um, I give you the two things that I know without any names attached to them, because one of them I know for, for like confidential reasons. Um, yes, physicians have hired uh, support staff to interact with the PDMPs. And in some cases, not necessarily with opiates, manufacturers are providing staff to the physicians to help them interact with these constraints. Because there, I mean, that's, I mean, so you could model that very easily with the, just a, a fixed cost. Yeah. Uh, although you the, could contemplate, I mean, the, the manufacturer's doing it. It's just, it's like, I'm going to give you a, a nurse. Sure, sure. It's just a bigger mm -hmm. omega, right? Yeah. yeah. But, but, but know, they have the other way you can think about it is say, look, if, if, if I'm prescribing above this mm -hmm. threshold amount, it's worth it for me to invest in this additional personnel, right. which then lowers the delta, right? you know, for my. So discreetly. As a, as a, yeah, yeah. And so you can have. That might be one way to, I mean, given that you're teeing this up, I presume that this is alluding to empirical results we're about to see. Yeah. Um, so that might be one way to get this to kind of naturally fall out of the model that you could then also try to kind of verify by poking around a little bit. Okay. All right. Good idea. Yeah. Oh, I was gonna, I was gonna say also, uh, have you tried to leverage alpha at all in your empirical work? So I'm interpreting alpha as like an agency cost kind of. Uh, parameter, right? It's it's basic. It's it's tuning the incentives of the physician. It's the physician's utility weight for patient health, which I would view as an agency cost kind of parameter, okay. right? So okay. if alpha is equal to one, then the the basically there's no agency problem. Right. Right. So, okay. Just, yeah. Good right? point. Yes. Yes. So presumably there's observable proxies for agency problems, um, and that might be another kind of avenue to kind of validate uh, the model um, a little bit. Yeah. My physician's alpha isn't one. I'm not <laughs> Your physician's alpha is definitely not one. <laughs> Good point. No, we'll look into that. I think that's another great suggestion. Thank you. All right. So let me um, let me in uh, seven or eight minutes uh, get to the empirical analysis. If we only get to table one, I think that's fine. That's the big picture story here, right? So what data are we using? We're using this Sunshine Act. Uh, open payments data from 2014 to 2017. The data actually exists in 2013, sort of, but it starts in August of 2013 through December. So it's uh, much less of a year. The Sunshine Act, uh, again, has physician name, address, date of payments. Um, we are going to get rid of, of the non-research, uh, I'm going to get rid of the research and the equity payments and keep only uh, the general payments. Uh, we match. We need, of course, to get to the denominator because some doctors don't get any payments, and if they don't get payments, they're not in the Sunshine Act data. So we need to merge this to the panel of actually active doctors in the United States. Um, that turned out to be an enormously irritating thing. So even though I have scarce time, since it took me like four days banging my head against my computer, I want to talk about it. Um, I found out after like a day and a half of looking, thinking to myself, where is the blasted crosswalk file between the ID number in the Sunshine Act and the NPI, which is the National Prescriber uh, Identification Number that is given by the DEA to everybody who prescribes controlled substances, in fact, all, all prescribers, I think. Um, where's the crosswalk? I found out that the enabling legislation for the Sunshine Act prohibited uh, CMS from releasing the NPI. <laughs> I said, about it. okay, fine. You know, the, the base data that we're going to get all the, all the docs from, all the characteristics, it's got physician name. And then, of course, after wondering why am I only getting 25% matches, it turns out 
that there are a lot of different ways to spell John Maynard Keynes um, in Athens, Georgia. It can be John Maynard Keynes. It can be John in John M. Period Keynes. It can be John M. No period Keynes. It can be John Keynes. Um, and indeed. I don't know if it's coincidental, but when you just sort the data and look, it's almost never the case that the same way of writing the same person's name is repeated uh, from year to year. Every year it's different, right? So we had this iterative process of cleaning it from extraneous data. If it's John Maynard O'Kane's, sometimes there's the apostrophe and sometimes there's not, right? So um, after a long time, uh, we finally got about an 88% match between the base uh, in PBS data, which is the list of all the phys active physicians with some characteristics, and the um, open the uh, Sunshine Act data. So that's really irritating. Uh, if any of you want to use this data, and you're happy with the way we did it, contact me. I'll send you a crosswalk file between these two because I just I wish I, I talked to Coastly that we should really validate this really really hard, and then we should just publish somewhere on the web. Hey, here's the crosswalk file. I don't really care what CMS thinks about it. Um, but she hasn't said yes to that yet, so we'll see. Uh, but if you want it, let me know. You can have it. All right. So um, we also want to pull all the opiates. That's easy because we've got some very standardized uh, opiate names, some list of names, and Happily, in the open payments data, they don't seem to be monkeying around with the drug names, even though they do monkey around with the doc names. All right, uh, we need to know the volume, right? We need to know how many opiate prescri prescriptions these docs are writing. Um, there's not an actual list of all the prescriptions that physicians write. We look where the streetlight is, so we took the Medicare Part D prescriber public, uh, public use files match that to this open payments data and looked at the volume of Medicare Part D opiate prescribers. So when you see top prescriber in just a second, you should interpret that as top Medicare prescriber, right? Leaving aside that they may not be, you know, this is not capturing other payers. Our must access data is taken from Buck, Mueller, and Cary. These are the states uh, in 2000, in, as far as December 2014 with must access PDMPs. These are the states in 2017, right? So we're going to be running very basic diff and diff. There's nothing fancy here, so there's no point in bearing on it. This is going to be outcomes uh, as far as uh, the amount of money that they're receiving from the manufacturer as a function of a must access PDMP, uh, characteristics of the physician, uh, age, and think of that sort, characteristics of the county that they're living in. And then we're going to, of course, just saturate it with. Um, Specialty fixed effects, time fixed effects, and, and uh, county fixed effects. Right? Not physician fixed effects, but at least county fixed effects. We're also going to run a volume of this where we're interacting with high volume. So again, in this model, what we would expect is we're going to see reductions in, in payments when must access PDPs come in place. But if it's a high volume doc, we should see a countervailing positive uh, effect there. So uh, with two minutes left, what do we find? Well, we find that uh, across our specifications with different sorts of uh, different sorts of measures for the being a top five percent prescriber or a top two percent prescriber or just ignoring uh, that altogether, we find that when must access PDMPs go in place, we get significant reductions in the uh, likelihood that the doctor gets any payments, right? Um, but that this is offset by the largest uh, the largest providers, uh, both in the five percent level. Uh, and at the 2% level. The treatment effect gets larger when we get to the most, you know, the most intensive uh, Medicare prescribers at least. Uh, male doctors get more money from, uh, from uh, manufacturers than uh, female doctors and uh, doctors who've been around longer uh, or older get, uh, this is actually years of experience, not age, I think, as I recall. They get more money as well. What about breaking it down on the, in, uh, the extensive margin, that was the intensive margin. On the extensive margin, uh, we don't actually see an awful lot uh, about having a, a, a must access a PDMP for the amount, conditional on getting anything. So this gets to your question at the very beginning. Is $13 really what's going on? It may just be you get something as opposed to getting nothing, right? We don't see an awful lot of action uh, in terms of both the number, of the amount of payments or the number of times they get a payment, where these payments presumably are like a detailed visit. Yeah. So you've unfortunately led me by the hand to ask this question. Of course, please. Slide, but 
you basically concede that volume is going to be endogenous in the real world, right? Yeah, so yeah. Because you, you sort of make that caveat yeah. in, in your theoretical framework, right? So do you have any type of like IV or uh, any... We have not yet, yeah, but you're, you're absolutely right that this is something we have to, we have to address moving forward, yeah, yeah. So, no, we don't. At, at least, uh, yeah, at least on the, uh, I mean, the, yeah, it's, 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 even if this is just Medicare, that's still something that is subject to physician behavior. And indeed, one of the extensions that my daughter Ashley and I have talked about taking the theoretical model and hopefully finding a way to test it is to actually think about how the information in the PDMP, so this is a, a real, really speculative, here, where are we going next? Uh, so Ashley and I have talked about, um, you know, what about the response that drug-seeking patients have to this open payments data? Maybe if I know in, intrinsically that doctors get bribed to prescribe more, I can go to the open payments data exactly to find the doctors who have been given a lot of money by the manufacturers and go to those thinking that that, in fact, might increase my chances of getting access to the drug. I hope, I hope I, not many economists <laughs> get addicted to opioids. <laughs> <laughs> the, the possible uh, information channels here. But, but even with this simple model, that does come out. That does come out of it when you when you sort of quickly work it through. So that's an area that we. But all of that, of course, to say that yeah, I mean, volume clearly needs to be dealt with in ways that we're not currently. Yeah. But I would have been very disappointed if no economist asked me about the endogeneity of at least one of our variables. <laughs> Uh, let me just quickly say, because I, I know I realize we're out of time. Uh, we're seeing uh, the effect is going to be uh, it's going to be mostly felt uh, in uh, on the extensive margin in urban, not rural areas. Uh, most of the action turns out to be for the category of meals. So, yeah, for other things like speaking fees, we're not seeing an awful lot. There are several other categories we're not showing you here. Meals is where most of the action is. It turns out, but again, that's on the extensive margin the most common reason that uh, these these are given. We did a placebo test by looking at the impact uh, of non-opioid payments, and we never find anything statistically significant there. So um, giving, uh, giving, getting money from antibiotics doesn't drive this opiate prescribing behavior, so that's, that's good. I will say, uh, now that I'm out of time and you can't ask me questions about it, uh, you may have seen that we did an event analysis. It's not as clean as you'd like it to be, so we definitely need to work through that, and we recognize that. The fact that I'm not showing you the slide tells you that I know that we've got a problem with that. All right, so I think probably we're out of time, and I've uh, told you all of this, so all conclusion slides are always superfluous anyway. <laughs> Thank you very much for your questions and your comments, and we'll be reflecting those in the next version of the paper. Thank you. Thanks so much for being here, David. Just two quick announcements. Uh, next week, Professor Audrey Beck from San Diego State will be uh, presenting on police shootings. So I'm really excited about that. And second, we have two bonus sort of seminars by two of our for former students from uh, San Diego State's uh, master's program in economics uh, that are now PhD students at the University of California, Irvine, and are on the job market this year. Uh, so they're coming prior to going on the job market to present their job market papers here in CHEP seminars on the 13th of uh, December, our Thursday usual seminar time and then the other will present on, on Friday morning. So that's Brittany Bass and Tim Young that's uh, on the flyer. So they're looking forward to getting feedback before they go out into the jungle uh, in January. So thank you again so much, David, for being here. Thanks for coming, and please grab food on the way out. Take care.